Have you ever experienced someone ask you what you do and when you say artist, they shortly follow with a request for you to supply art to the local art society or charity or can you do these flyers for us? (laughs) Or maybe you're selling art and you've been asked how much is your artwork and when you give the price, that person will start to haggle you down and may even offer you half of the price that you've just said. This is what I want to talk about in this episode. I want to talk about why people tend to devalue art and more so I want to talk about what it is that you can do to change that view and make people see the value in what you do. So this conversation came from a post that I shared on social media. I think the post was something along the lines of I'm an artist and yes, I have bills like the rest of you. So no, I'm not doing work for free. And Giles Whitehead asked a question of why is this the case? Why do people devalue what we do? And I thought it was a super question. So of course, there is no one reason, but I thought it was a great question and I wanted to just dig in my view on this. And of course, we've all got different views. So I would absolutely love to hear your view on this topic. But this is my theory. There's a, there's a few reasons. And I think number one is it's a learned behavior. So if we look back in our, our history, our art has always been historically for the elite and if you made it as an artist, it's because you you had connections and you had to go through the system. You had to be very well educated in the academy. All of these things that ended up leaving this belief that it was impossible for anyone else to become an artist. And then I think from, from those times, and of course, then the Bohemians, who made art for art's sake, not for money, then created this starving artist myth. Well, it wasn't a myth, it was it was true, that's what they stood for, but it kind of created this ripple effect of the starving artist, and that's actually, if you want to be an artist, you've got to sacrifice um, a lot. And I think all, all of these things from historic times have, have filtered through, but it's still really, really... A thing today and I know that when I was a child and approaching school age where it was time to decide what to do you know being an artist was never an option and I'm I'm not sure if it even is today in the careers service but it definitely wasn't an option when I was a child and in fact most parents and I'm generalizing here, but most people that I know were told by parents, no way are you doing art, no way are you doing design. It was frowned upon. It was, you know, not, not everybody's family was like that, but a big majority of families, there was a real fear and still is, I believe, around people pursuing art and this vision of it leading to misery and struggle and and financial pain and turmoil and embarrassment because it's not a real education this is what some people believe um it's not a science so there are so many people's opinions on this matter and i think because of that there is still a lot to be frowned upon today it's still like that and It's crazy because I know, I know so many people that make an amazing living from art and I think we can do things to change this learned behaviour. So some of the things that we can do, and that's why I'm passionate about running United Art Space and sharing the messages from people who are selling their artwork, who are making an impact with their artwork. Because for me, it's not always just about selling. It's not just about making money from art. It's about what that art is doing in society, to other people's lives, to people's mental health, to the person who made it, to the person that bought it. All of that changes the view of the importance of art. And more so, the fact that you can actually make a living from it. And there are lots of people making a living from the arts. It's one of the biggest businesses in the world, the arts. 
the arts are everywhere. We cannot function without the creative industries. It's massive. And so I do think it is starting to change, but there is still a lot of stigma around what an artist is. In fact, someone said to me the other day, I wrote it on an application form and somebody looked at me and went, an artist, really? Is that a real profession? Do you really make money from that? So there is still massively this belief in many people because also you've got to remember that these people that have had that belief instilled in them, maybe from the generation before us, and then they filtered that down into the generation below. If those people did end up going down different routes in life and they don't know any artists, they're not in the creative industries, then they still carry that belief. They they don't know any different. And there are a lot of people in the world that do not understand the creative industries. They're not in it. They are the ones that really believe that it's just not possible. Um, so yes, there are a lot of people still out there who don't understand and will look at a, a frown upon artist being put down as a profession because it's just not possible. But it is possible. So we, what we can do, I believe, is keep sharing. And this is why I keep sharing all the time around what people are doing and the amazing things happening in our hub community and the amazing success from our members, but not just in our community. If you go looking, it's, it's worldwide and it's exciting. And I believe that children should be shown this in school, that we should be going in and doing talks in schools to show that this is, there's a whole world here, the creative industries. It's a really exciting place to be. Um, and no, it's not easy. Just like any business isn't easy. Um, so yeah, I believe that we should do more to share and we should do more to also look for those people who are making it happen and learn from them and share their stories too so we kind of have this ripple effect so that's one of the reasons I do what I do because I want to retrain this this learned behavior of artist is only it's it's not possible and it means that you're going to have a life of misery and on all of that it's just not true um and the other thing as well on this, while we're on this topic of the belief of earning money solely from your art, which is completely possible. I have lots of friends who earn all of their money from art alone. It's completely possible. But also it's okay to make make a certain amount of money from your art and side hustle other things sometimes I'm just sharing this quickly it's going off topic slightly but it does come from this belief system that if I have to make money elsewhere then I'm not really an artist but you are it's totally normal to as especially as you're setting up as an artist to make money from your art and have something alongside that maybe whether it's teaching work running workshops a little part-time job that is normal it's normal in any business not just as an artist if you were kind of setting up as a hairdresser or a plumber you know to begin with whilst you're you're gaining customers and reputation you might be doing some side hustling which is fine it doesn't mean that you're no longer a plumber or you're no longer a hairdresser so don't also devalue yourself um, based on you 100% earning a living just from your art sales. It doesn't take away from the fact that you are an artist. Now, the second reason is that I don't think sometimes people see the value in what we do or what you do. And again, this goes back to them not understanding what it takes to be an artist. So there are people that will just come across your artwork and they just don't get it. They just see something that they want. You'll give a price, they'll try and haggle. Um, and it's because they just don't understand it. They don't see the value. Now, also bear in mind that when people haggle or try and negotiate, Usually it's because one, they're trying their luck because quite often if somebody gives a price and you go in lower, that person, if they say, yeah, okay, I'll accept that offer. 
the other person buying will go, thank goodness I didn't pay for that full price. And quite often people are testing. They're testing whether there's any room for negotiation because until you ask, you don't know. So there is a cultural thing, especially where a lot of people will not pay the first price you give them in case you are going to be flexible. And what it shows when you are flexible is one, they shouldn't have paid the full price in the first place because you've actually gone down on what you said it was. Um, and then two, it makes them then believe that, okay, the price that you're giving is not the actual price. Next time I'm going to haggle with you because obviously there's room for negotiation. So that's another reason around this perception of, de of you know, not valuing what we say it is as well, which is why sticking to your prices is a really good idea because quite often people are just testing the water. And if you then go down on your price, um, you're the one losing out because you're the one that's come down from the price that you actually wanted. And if you priced it properly, then that's the price that you actually need for the artwork. I'm not saying you shouldn't haggle. I'm not saying you shouldn't negotiate. There's always a time and a place. There are lots of artists that like to be flexible in their pricing. They like to offer discounts. That's absolutely fine if it works for you. I'm in the camp of I don't do that. I much prefer to offer more value or if somebody can't afford something that I priced that will offer something of a lower cost that fits their budget, but we never devalue the offer that we have priced at. But like I say, that's just us and that rule does not always fit everything. So it's okay if you if you do choose to slash prices, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and then what can we do around helping people see the value in what we do. So these people that really just don't understand what it is to be an artist, they've probably just seen artwork, I like it, here we go. Or you give them the price and they're like, why would it be that much? So what we can do as artists is help people see the value in what we do. This is where social media is fantastic because on social media, you can share behind the scenes, you can share in your studio, you can share all the work that goes on behind the scenes that people just don't see. And that is starting to grow this vision of what it actually takes to be an artist. There's more to it than I don't just sit down and paint, or you might do, I'll come to that in a second. You know, I go out and research, I take photographs, I experiment, this piece of work didn't go right, it's gonna end up going somewhere else. This amazing piece of artwork that you see here was actually number 10. All the other ones didn't work out. People don't see that behind the scenes. And so when you start to share some of this on your social media, people then start to realize, okay, it's not as easy as it looks. Um, so you can share your process. You can share the time spent on it and what goes on behind the scenes and the fact that you're researching, you're learning, you're doing all of these things. Now, that being said, on the flip side, if your process is fast and easy and it doesn't take you that long to create an artwork, that doesn't mean that your artwork doesn't have value. I've worked with a lot of people over the years that say it literally takes me 15 minutes to make an artwork and I feel so guilty putting a big price on it because how can I justify that cost when it actually didn't take me that long to make? And what I know to be true in any business, not just art, is this term called supply and demand. So supply and demand works on the basis of pricing and demand. If you have demand for something, the price goes up. The more demand you have, the higher the price goes up. And I learned this at business school and I'm a, I'm a bit hazy on it now. <laughs> it's quite simple. <laughs> but, you know, say... Say you're selling artwork and it's $200 and you're, you're selling all of the artwork at that price point that you create, then you put your prices up. That is the time. It's supply and demand. The demand has eaten up what you have and you can't keep up. So you put the price up and it lowers the demand slightly. So you're doing less work for more money. So Pricing isn't always about how long an artwork takes you to make, how much it, all, it costs you in terms of materials. That is one factor, 100% in terms of pricing, but it's not the only factor. The big factor is supply and demand. The more 
you can increase the desire and demand for what you do, the more your pricing will go up, the more value. <laughs> so this can be done in many ways. And Hub members, if you're listening, I've got a whole lesson inside the Hub membership, which is our platform for helping people make art a living. There's a whole lesson inside the Hub on selling. And in there, I give you um, psychological triggers to help people see um, the value in your artwork and what you can do to create desire. For now, in this podcast episode, what I want to share is just a few tips of things that you can do to start to create more desire for what you have. One is sharing the emotional connection between people and your artwork. People buy artwork because they have an emotional connection of some kind. And the more you can connect people to your artwork in that way, the better. Now, what does this mean exactly? So it's sharing things that other people have said about your artwork, things that other people have seen in the way it made them feel. This artwork made me remember times on holiday so warm and I've put it up in my dining room and it just, every time I walk in, I can feel the sun. It reminds me of, you know, it's these kinds of stories where people read it and go, oh my gosh, yeah, I see that now in that artwork. And these are how, these stories, these are how you can create desire. Even if you didn't make the artwork with that intention, hearing people's views and sharing them on your social media, and they might all be different. It might make one person feel this way and, and another person that way. You share them because other people read and they see themselves in that comment and go, yeah, I feel that. Oh, I want, I want this artwork. So that's one way. Um, another way is the purpose. Like what is the purpose of your artwork? When you start to show people what they can do with the artwork, that starts to create the desire and the demand. If you're just sharing an artwork and no one can really put it into context in terms of size, do I hang this? Do I have to frame it? Do I, what do I do with it? I see so much artwork that I love and I'm th asking myself these questions as I see it. And it puts me off because I'm like, I, I, I want to buy it, but I just don't know what I'll do with it when I get it. So really putting some work behind showing your art in situ in what happens when they buy it, show it, is it going on the wall? Is it, what's happening to this artwork? What's the purpose? Um, give some people ideas of what they can do with your artwork after they have bought it. It's really important because this is why lifestyle magazines work. This is why Pinterest is so popular. People are looking and when they see something in context, people put themselves in that situation and go, oh, look at that artwork above that fireplace. That artwork would look great against my fireplace or above my fireplace. And so you're, you're constantly inspiring people. Um, so it's helping people see what they can do with it. That, that starts to help create de demand and desire. Um, some of the other things are social proof. So if you're selling, especially sharing that artwork, this artwork just sold, it's going off somewhere, red dots. I don't know if you've ever been to an exhibition where uh, there's lots of artworks by different artists and you're looking around and there's lovely art and you're like, oh, that's nice. And you go to another stand, oh, that's nice. And there's red dots everywhere and there's only like two or three left. It's psychological for people to then start to go, oh my gosh, this is in demand. The other people are, are buying this. I should get one quick before they all go. So also people like to think they make their own decisions, but often people are led by what other people do. So red dots and things selling reinforces that internal subconscious decision-making brain that this must be okay. This must be safe to buy because other people are buying it and actually other people are buying it and I don't want to miss out. Even if you're consciously thinking that or not, that is what the brain does. That's why little red dots work really well and things that are selling works really well. Um, so you can do more things like that. If you're not selling yet, then just share what people have said about the artwork. Um, because again, all those things help to drive desire and drive demand. So there's a few things that you can do. Um, the final piece of this in terms of why I feel people don't always see the value in asking for you to 
to create an artwork for free or asking you to just give us this artwork so we can go and give it to this charity? Or could you just spend the day working here and create this mural for the arts community? Quite often people don't understand or see the consequences of asking you that. So what I mean by this is I could ask you to spend a day working for me and and doing it for free. Um, and quite often, uh, I'm going to talk about the benefits of doing this at times, because I, I do this, I do lots of stuff for free, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong in it, because I'll talk about that in a second. But quite often, though, people fall in the trap of doing things all the time for free and giving themselves away, and they're feeling devalued, and they're feeling like they're being taken advantage of and it's because they've got into the spiral of saying yes to things all the time and giving themselves all the time and if you're in that state then of feeling like you're being taken advantage of quite often there's there's some things you can do to start saying no and protecting your time so quite often people just don't realize the consequences so in asking some people might be absolutely fine with that and they might benefit from it in some way, which is fantastic. But if it's not the case and you're feeling drained and you're sick of people asking you, then here's my advice. One is don't get defensive. If you find yourself getting defensive, which is, it will usually be the case if you're at that stage of feeling drained by people, you'll want to go just like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> But try try to take the emotion out of it and just go back to people and start to say no and start to explain why, um, you know, I can't give you this artwork because I art, making art is a living for me. So if I give this artwork away, um, it starts to impact the money that I make. And, and in just saying it in a nice way that and I can't really afford to just give things away as much as I would like to. So, some, sometimes as simple as that, where people go, oh my gosh, yeah, sorry, yeah, of course. Um, or sometimes it's explaining that if, you know, if, if, I, if I do this for you for free, it's taken me away from my family. You know, I only have so much time. A lot of my time is dedicated to making art. And then the rest of my time I spend with my family. And if, if I'm taken away from that, I'm not with them. And these are the consequences when you're always saying yes to things and giving so much of yourself. And you have to look at your time as well and see whether you have the, the time to invest in these free things and do these things. Because if you don't, and actually what are you, what are you removing yourself away from is always a good indication of whether you need to say no or yes. And just then explaining that I can't because taking me myself away from this means that I'm not here. I'm not it might not just be with family there might be some other reasons um on the flip side of that you know sometimes it's okay to do things for free it's okay to give back to your community it's okay to do things for others there's a thing that i always bear in mind which is return on investment and so if i'm asked to do something for free or i'm contributing towards something i always think of the return on investment which means am I getting something back for this? And it can feel quite selfish, but it's it's just touching base with, is this serving me in any way? And it's not always about money. You know, return on investment can be money. It can be financial. So what am I going to gain from this financially? But it doesn't always have to be financial. Sometimes it can be that I'm going to gain really good experience from this. It's actually going to raise my profile and get me in front of people. Sometimes it might just be a nice thing to do and it makes you feel good as a person. Um, sometimes, I mean, I'm part of a community where I'm in a membership and we all take it in turns to provide lessons. So the membership that I'm in don't provide lessons to us. We, there's a big group of us in this membership and every month we all provide lessons, um, even though we're paying, <laughs> but it actually works really, really well. We're all very, very giving in this community. We all support each other and we create content to when we learn something, we pass that on. We do that inside our communities as well. Our members will share what's working and they'll do demos. Um, and, and it's because it's this self-fulfilling platform where people, people give part of themselves and then they get so much back from other people too. 
So in terms of art, sometimes you might want to maybe put aside a goal that I'll just give three pieces away a year or, uh, you know, this is what I do. I have a limit on what I'm going to do for free. Otherwise, I would literally spend all day doing things for free and then, and then I won't be making anything. So there has to be limits. And that's what I do. I, I carve out a certain amount of time to give back. I do believe in giving back. I think it's a good thing to do. But then I also am very mindful of valuing my time and valuing what I do. Um, and maybe there's just a certain amount of art that you say, I'm going to give this to charity, or maybe I'm going to give a percentage to charity every year. And then you know that you've given back in some way. I'm totally going off on a tangent here, I think. <laughs> so going back to the consequences of people asking, um, again, I think it's you having boundaries as well. So it's you having boundaries and knowing that it's okay to say no, try not to get defensive, just explain the consequences of, of, you know, why you can't take that opportunity and what it will be taking you away from. And also knowing that quite often people will take advantage if you let them take advantage. And if you're finding yourself in that situation over and over, it's usually because of you. It's usually because you've not placed boundaries on your time and what you're doing. And the more that you end up doing that and you say no, you'll end up starting to see that people won't take as much advantage. This brings me back to the final tip, which is we cultivate our world through the lens that we see and the way we, we behave. So quite often, if we are surrounded by people that are asking us all the time, we can do something to flip this around and we can start to say no and we can start to remove ourselves. When we're in that world and we can only see these people and they're surrounding us, sometimes we think that the whole world is like that, but it isn't. There are people out there that will value what you do. There are people out there that invest in art and they care about artists and they want you to do well. And so if you're in this situation where you're finding that you're surrounded by people that are very negative about art, that they don't value you. They just keep haggling you down. There are things that you can do to start to shift yourself and transition away from those people and know that the whole world does not exist like that. So you can start by surrounding yourself with artists who are valued. Surround yourself with people who are making a living. Start to surround yourself with people who value art. Go on a hunt for them. And you will start to notice that when you own your boundaries and you really value what you do and you stick to them, you will start to filter people, those people that are there to just take from you because they know they're going to get something for free will start to fizzle away. And you'll start to then cultivate people around you who do want to invest and who care for you. Um, when you place those boundaries, the people who really care about you will respect them. The people that don't, then they're not your people. If you place boundaries on your time and what you're doing, and, and it's with in the intention because you want to spend more time with your family, or this is what I need to make a living. And if people don't respect those boundaries, they are not your people. Let them go. Because anybody that actually cares about you and understands this would go, yeah, okay, I respect that. No, I won't push it. Um, and they're the kind of people you want in your world. So get comfortable saying no, create your own boundaries and stick to them and feel good about them. And the people that come across, and they will, there'll always be people that try and haggle you down, that try and negotiate, that don't see what you do, that they think your work is crap. They will always exist. But when you own yourself, your boundaries, your value, what your art is worth, and you say no to situations that come up that don't fit with your mission, you'll be much more empowered. And it's great sometimes to just say, no, thank you so much for this opportunity, but I'm going to say no on this occasion. Okay, Whew, that's it. Um, let me know anyway what, what you think about this topic. Why do you think people devalue art? There's posts on our social media you can go back and have a look at. And you could also leave a review as well on um, iTunes and Spotify. Um, so I'd love to see comments on there as well about what you think. And before I go, 
If you are interested in learning more about making a living or just getting your art out into the world, maybe selling that first piece, finding out who your people are, where you can put your artwork. Our Make Art Your Living workshops begin on the 1st of September. They run for two weeks. They are free and we come together as a big group. It's awesome to start to dig into all of these questions about selling and it's a super, super productive two weeks. It's very exciting to be part of. So you can find the link in the show notes and you can sign up ready for the wait list when we begin. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And I hope you have a great, great week and uh, I'll speak to you all very soon. Bye-bye.